Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webisode of Peers and Pubs. I'll picture this, the art of presenting science. Unlike a typical undergraduate experience, if you found your way here by accident and you were intending to be in a different Zoom room, please stay. You're bound to have a great time anyway. My name is Christina Wright, and I am the city coordinator for the Boston and Cambridge chapter of Taste of Science, and of course, your peers and pubs host. Oh boy. <laughs> Laura, you're muted. <laughs> Shush. This is professional. We get people <laughs> team today. Hi, guys. What's going on? Over here at Scientist Inc. and Taste of Science, want to wish Dr. Christina Wright congratulations for successfully defending her dissertation this week. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah, so that's the, the cat's out of the bag. I had a really crazy week, but I guess technically now I am Dr. Christina Wright. But let's not get hung up in the details and let's get back to our talk for today. So for those of you who are new to our program, Peers and Pubs is a way for any and all of you to learn about some of the work that is written in scientific publications. Each time you join us, we'll be asking a different specialist to explain a scientific publication or a recent published work, and we'll be bringing you along for the ride. Now, a couple more things before we get started. We have a chat box open on both Zoom and Facebook, so you should feel free to come and say hello. Let us know who you are, where you are, and if you're anything like us, what you're drinking. <laughs> if you're on Zoom, please leave any questions you want answered in the Q&A box because we'll miss it if you put it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, we'll have someone scouting for your questions, so go ahead and leave them in the chat there. So chat on Facebook, Q&A on Zoom. I also want to let you know about something we're calling jargon alert. I forgot my flyers today, but you need to remember this one particular point, and that is our goal during any of these programs is to make sure that you, the public, and anybody who's attending come away with an understanding of what we're talking about. So if there's any point during today's discussion where you feel like you need a little bit more clarification, go ahead and put it in the Q&A on Zoom or the chat on Facebook when you need a little bit more information. So go ahead and ask, feel free to interrupt. Um, we are here to make sure that you come out of this experience learning everything that you need um, to move on without any further questions. So uh, to keep things light, I also wanna let you know that we're gonna have an interactive activity a little later where we're gonna be looking at some interesting uh, examples <laughs> of data visualization. Interesting is a kind word for some of them. There will be some peers and pubs prizes sent to our winners. So you should really play. I'll tell you a little bit more about what those are later, but I'll keep you guessing for now. All right, so before we look at beautiful data, let's get warmed up with a quick poll question. What comes to mind when you think of the term plot? If you're on Zoom, you should be able to interact with this poll now. So I'm gonna wait a little bit for you guys to put in your responses. So let me think, what comes to mind when you think of the term plot? Well, for me, it's like, I don't know, the plot of your favorite story to the place where you plant those like delectable heirloom tomatoes. If anybody's a big fan of heirloom tomatoes, I highly recommend the pink brandy one variety. Okay, so like maybe we're thinking number three, who killed Kennedy? That is also a plot. And the last option we've got going on here is, are we thinking scatter or violin? All right, we'll wait a little bit longer to make sure I get all of the votes in. Do, 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 do. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So scatter or violin is the winner. So that means we have some scientific minded members in our audience. So for those of you that are not familiar, a scatter plot and a violin plot are both ways that you can visualize data. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what that is. The other ones are just fun, fun examples of other ways that we use plot in everyday, uh, everyday language. Okay, thanks for participating. Let's move on to our next item. All right. So today, the theme of today's show is how we visualize science. 
If you noticed at the beginning, we had some examples of bad data visualization, including some examples from our own peers and pubs crew. People are really putting themselves on the front lines here. It's pretty easy to see how data visualization can go awry. However, it's not just the making of graphs that's tricky. Understanding the data that they present is a whole nother hurdle. And thanks to the pandemic, we've all probably been looking at graphs outside of our expertise more than we've ever expected. But hold up, did you know that the way scientists look at graphs is actually different than the way non-scientists look at graphs? Well, we're gonna talk about it. Specifically, let's do an itsy bitsy paper review based on an article called Seeing Data Like an Expert, an eye-tracking study using graphical data uh, representation. So let me figure out how to share my screen now. All right. So we should be looking at the, the title of this article at this time. And so in this study, one graph was shared with faculty members, advanced science majors, and non-science majors. And the coolest part is they use this eye tracking software to see which parts of the graph each participant looked at. Here, we're just looking at the graph, an example of a graph that they may have been using in this study. And then here on the right, we're looking at what those eye tracking data looked like. So the purple dots are placed where graduate students were looking and bigger or multiple purple dots in one place mean that they spent more time looking at that spot on the graph. Generally, as expertise increased, participants were more likely to display directed search patterns by initially focusing on contextual and graph data features, whereas less experienced participants demonstrated more sporadic search patterns that oscillated between task-based cues and other image elements. Wait a minute, <laughs> let's try that again. Essentially, they found that faculty spent more time looking at the axes and data, whereas non-science majors spent more time reading the text on a written graph. This is critical because paying attention to different graph features means that what two people take away from the same graph can be very different. So how can you start reading graphs like a scientist? Well, reading graphs is a skill like any other, and I've got some tips for you. So let's get started with axes. The x-axis down here along the bottom may contain categories or numbers, and you always read it from the bottom left of the graph over to the right of the graph. And then the y-axis, or the y-axis up here usually contains numbers. Again, you wanna read it from the bottom left of the graph, and then we're gonna go up to the top. Now let's add some data to these axes. Bar graphs like this one are used to show numbers that are independent of each other, meaning the data that make up each bar stand alone. In this case, it's good to check that the y-axis over here begins at zero to make sure we're looking at fair comparisons between each of these separate plots. So what if we put the data in a pie chart instead? We can present the same information in a form like this. However, this message shows the data or this method shows the data as more of a, de a dependent data sample. And this is because each slice of the pie is represented in relation to the other slices as part of a whole group of ice cream. Pie charts show percentages of a whole. So it's critical to note that you wanna make sure the pie chart slices always add up to 100. And you'd be surprised, sometimes that doesn't always take place. Okay, let's talk line graphs. Graphs like these show us how numbers can change over time on the x-axis. Line graphs are super useful to demonstrate trends in a group of data. So they're usually used to show dependent data. Once again, it's critical to take a look at all of the values on the y-axis because they don't always start with zero. 
So what might happen if the y-axis doesn't reflect the appropriate scale to view a particular set of data? Well, your interpretation of the result can dramatically change. Take a look at this example where someone is talking about climate change. At first glance, it doesn't look like much is happening at all because we see this straight line of temperature. It doesn't seem to be changing much over a period of a lot of years. But that's because the y-axis isn't zoomed in enough to the data for us to see what's important. So we know that a few degrees of temperature change causes catastrophic damage. So why are we looking at a range of zero to 110 degrees? The extra numbers on the scale shrink the critical trend to nothing. It's far more reasonable per, to represent data like this, where we have a zoomed in version of that y-axis that doesn't start at zero and shows only a five degree difference of change. Here we can more easily say, more easily see the trend toward an increase in the data. Um, and it's definitely a lot different than what we saw on the previous slide. So this has been a super brief glimpse into interpreting very basic data graphs here, but these kinds of examples and more can be found in educational resources produced by Carl Bergstrom and, Je and Jevin or Yuvine West, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. They have a book and an excellent website where you can go through examples and see how data can be represented not so well. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing here. That's our little intro to how to read graphs. And now we're gonna move on. So we've gone through all of our extras. We've talked about how to read very basic data graphs, but we haven't introduced our main event. So I wanna start by saying welcome to our specialist, scientist, and presenter for today, Dr. Shraddha Nayak. Thank you so much for joining us. Shraddha is a postdoctoral fellow in scientific visualization. She is training to be an expert at visualizing scientific information, especially in cellular and molecular research. Like many of us with a keen eye, she appreciates good design in everyday life. Natural or man-made, she's always looking for a great composition to capture. She thrives on new experiences and well-told stories, but most importantly, she comes from India and specializes in using two-thirds for brain at all times to decide on her next meal. <laughs> You're just like me. <laughs> Welcome, Shraddha. It's so nice to see you. How are you? Oh, we got to unmute you. You can hear me now, right? Yes, absolutely. Hello, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh my gosh, that's um, so great. Just just wanted to let you know that I have the, the pizza on just to celebrate that you've become a doctor just you know two days ago. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm excited to join the club. I have met you on the other side. <laughs> it's a very, very exciting time. Long end of a, a really intense journey as I'm sure it was for everybody else who made it too. <laughs> oh, all right, so. I know this is very exciting that Shraddha is joining us, but I we also have somebody else that's going to be coming to chat about data visualization with us today, and that's going to be her twin sister Deeksha. So can we come out? Can we welcome Deeksha to the panel, please? Where are we at? Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome aboard. I Thank have you. a sneaking suspicion. I have heard through the grapevine that it is pretty late where you are. So I'm, I'm just very impressed that you're, you're here with us and you're willing to hang out with, you know, this person you've had to spend a lot of your life with. <laughs> no, I haven't been this awake at 3 a.m. ever. <laughs> Well, we thank you for waking or staying up, uh, waking from your slumber or staying up super late at night. Um, to be able to join us today. So Deeksha, you are a finance professional who, yes. who focuses on finance stuff from nine to seven, but then you like to talk about food and you like to eat food pretty much every time of the day and every time of the week. Yeah. Yes. That's why we're twins. We have something in common. <laughs> Is that the only thing you have in common? <laughs> uh, I guess so. <laughs> kind of runs in the family. But then, I mean, she's, I know she's being super nice by, you know, waking up at 3 a.m. for me, but um, I do want to tell everybody that she has a reputation, a tiny reputation for being like the, the, the evil twin. 
Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> Read yes. even as adventurous. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it kind of started very God. early. So um, she um, kind of kicked me out of my mom 15 minutes earlier just to get a demo and see how things, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> happen. And uh, Ruma also has it that um, she she got a lot of the nutrition in the womb and I was kind of pushed off to the side. And that's why I've been skinny throughout my life compared <laughs> to her. <laughs> yeah, and she fights dirty, huh? I didn't realize <laughs> we had some sibling rivalry in the chat tonight. <laughs> All right. So now that we've already broken the ice, we're going to take it one step further. And actually, Shraddha, I think you have a story about Diksha that you want to share with us? to just get us feeling a little bit more comfortable with who you are, see what you bring to the table. What have you got for us? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to show you that I, I have a supportive family and I'll just show you um, some slides. But uh, before that, I just wanted to say that, so there was, um, uh, I have an Instagram handle and I, I like to post pictures there. So um, I had, Recently, maybe last year, I posted a picture of uh, a structural biologist that is, you know, a biologist who looks at structures of uh, proteins. And uh, this biologist was looking at a 3D printed form of, uh, of a protein, and that was a ribosome. And I hope everybody knows what a ribosome is. And then my sister turns up and she's like, hey, that looks like popcorn. And I just wanted to <laughs> kind of show that. So it, our, our, our ribosome. Are ribosomes popcorn? I, I would imagine they wouldn't taste as well. <laughs> yeah, it did look like a giant popcorn. I think Prada should share the slide. Everyone <laughs> agree. Oh, sweet. You guys able to see it? Okay. You know what? Actually, I, I see it too. Diksha, you were you were on target. I mean, it would be exactly. like a giant, giant piece of popcorn. But like maybe that would be something we'd all be looking forward to, especially if we're about to watch a long movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't really blame her. And then I had another one where this this I was doing when um, I I was it was early, you know, when I was learning illustration. So it was early in my career, and uh, I was making this one day, and then my mom was like kind of standing behind me, and she was like, "That looks like a commode." And for people <laughs> who don't know what a commode is, so it's a toilet toilet seat. <laughs> so okay, I just wanted I to say that I had a very supportive family. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. All right, Disha, we're going to give you a chance to, uh, to, to to give a little pushback here. Do you have any stories about Shraddha you would like to share with us? Uh, yeah, it's just that uh, I still don't know what my twin actually does for a living. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this goes way back in, I think, 2007, okay, when I had this uh, visa interview with... Uh, the U.S. Embassy, and uh, what happened is I was asked, what does uh, your twin do? Uh, what's her career? And uh, I just told them that uh, she's doing uh, something in the field of science, and I guess it is uh, microbiology. Okay, and I, and I just narrated this entire story to my twin, and she was like laughing at me, and she's like, you don't know what I do. It's like really sad. I'm really, you know, upset with the entire thing. And uh, are you doing microbiology, Shraddha? I'm not really sure as to what you're doing even now. So <laughs> Yeah, she, she still doesn't know. So um, I, I know for people who are not scientists, probably doesn't matter. But for people who actually know the differences between the sciences, the life sciences, and especially microbiology being a topic that I really did not like. And so, so for the record, I, I studied <laughs> biochemistry. That is what I studied. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, maybe, just maybe, maybe tonight's the night when both Diksha and I get a better understanding of what you do. And then maybe we resolve this years, years of conflict in just a single peers and pub session. What do you think? Is it possible? Hopefully, hopefully. She tried explaining things to me at like uh, you, uh, usual uh, day hours. It didn't, you know, get into my head. So she's trying at 3 a.m. now. So let's see. <laughs> All right. I love it. I feel like we're on the right track here. All right. So I have one more question um, and I'm going to hand it over for, uh, hand it over to Deesha for this one. What are some of the differences between data visualization in science versus accounting? Um, do you, do you have any thoughts about what the differences might be uh, or, or what's your experience with that? 
Uh, I can uh, talk from the finance point of view. I think uh, uh, we have a lot of tools for data visualization. So we have uh, tools in Microsoft Excel and Tableau where we have graphs, charts, and dashboards. Uh, because you know, there's a lot of data in a, micro, in a Microsoft spreadsheet, right? A lot of numbers. Oh, yeah. So to you know, convert uh, data into meaningful information, I think these tools are really helpful because you have to put across the right information to the audience or your stakeholders, right? Yeah, so I think yeah. it is quite similar to even, uh, I think the purpose is similar, the intention is similar for finance as well as science is what I can say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Shaha, do you have anything to add to that? No, I feel like I need to actually have a discussion with her on this. But I still remember this one time when this, I think it was your CV and you'd made like a tiny graph there about, I think your expertise level and some things. And I remember I had too many yeah. comments on it. <laughs> so um, yeah, but but yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad this is happening because we actually haven't really had a discussion. And I'm actually curious now as to how visualization happens in uh, finance. So Later, another another day when it's three a.m., I'm going to ping <laughs> Diksha and and see if she can talk about it. <laughs> All right, perfect. So I think that's good. Maybe maybe we helped you. Maybe we helped you bridge that gap and start that conversation. That could be that could be what we take away from <laughs> from me being able to help you today over the course of this episode. All right. So at this point, I want to take one quick moment to just remind everybody who's watching out in the audience here that you're welcome to say jargon alert in the chat. And Disha, actually, I think you have a handout which you're going to use to be able to interrupt your sister if you need a little bit more clarification. Yes. Perfect. So you're going to hand up the actual jargon alert um, whenever you need just a little bit more clarification. Um, and remember, if you're going to be participating on Zoom, you want to use the Q&A box. And if you're going to be participating on Facebook, you want to use the chat box. And if you have any questions that are not necessarily jargon alerts, don't you worry, we'll be collecting them. And then Shrata will be able to answer them at the end of our episode during the Q&A session. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Shrata for our main event. So please share your slides and take it over. We're excited to hear from our specials today. Awesome. Oops, hold on. Okay, there you guys are. <laughs> Where did you guys go? You all can see it well, right, Christina? Yeah, yep. Okay, awesome. In case you were wondering who was who in the picture, uh, <laughs> here I have some labels for you. And you can also note that I've always been one inch taller. <laughs> and uh, I was one inch wider as well. <laughs> That's true. Good one. Okay. <laughs> so I have some goals for today. Uh, one is um, to keep the and maybe all of you as well, if you are sleepy at the end of the week, awake and listening. And the other is to make sure that you feel that you're, you were better off spending and drinking your Friday night with us. And the other is um, to make sure you'll be able to explain what I do in two lines to a friend. So if I accomplish my goals, then please send me an email that uh, I did it. So thank you. <laughs> we will, I promise. <laughs> okay. So what I want to say is that we have come a long way to uh, look at things in biology from its overall form uh, of how an organism looks <laughs> and functions, something that we see with our own eyes, right down to the atomic level something that is invisible to us uh, and where we require amazing microscopy techniques to see things. Um, as, a molecular and, as molecular and cellular biologists and biochemists since M1, we study things at the minutest levels. How do cells look and function? What are these molecules inside of them? What are they doing there and why do they exist? So these are actually bustling cities inside of cells, just like how we see in the outside world. And learning about them is important because if, if something goes wrong, then it could manifest itself externally in the form of a disease or a condition or a feeling. So that's why we spend a lot of time peering into microscopes and doing experiments that tell us something about the tiny invisible world. Luckily, 
Now, scientists have been able to take portraits of biomolecules. Uh, by biomolecules, I mean uh, DNA, RNA, proteins, fats, sugars, all things in between. Uh, they hopefully remember this from school. I'm not sure if you do. <laughs> A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Isha, how about you? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to recall. <laughs> So this is a model of a protein keratin that you saw earlier in another slide. And scientists have figured out how, um, how these molecules look inside a cell. And this is one of them. Um, so they have also given us information on who hangs out with whom or who interacts with uh, you know, each other. So we also have group portraits that have come out where in this case, you see kind of two proteins you know, interacting with each other. And um, also keep in mind, uh, this is not exactly how they look. We have come up with different representations of biomolecules to make it easy for the community to see them and get information about them. So this is one type of representation. There are other, other representations as well. So I just wanted to show you um, uh, this because this is like a really cool database where all this you know, structural data information is uh, dumped into this, this space. So right now there are around 177,000 structures that have been discovered. So just like that keratin that you saw earlier. Are you amazed yet? That's a the, lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. And now it's not just about how they look, but we have been able to locate where the biomolecules are at a given point in time. And in this case, you, we use you know, fluorescence, uh, um, fluorescence to make the protein glow. So um, we can see where they are, they are situated. So in this case, this is a cancer cell and different proteins are stained with different colors. So you can see all of them. So I don't have a video, but then there are uh, time-lapse videos where the glow is moving, so you can actually track the, the protein. And some biochemistry experiments and some microscopy techniques are also there, which tell us how many are there you know, at a given point uh, in time and space, and also at what time scales these molecular processes happen. Did anybody raise their hands? No, I somehow felt Christina raised a hand. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm getting my hair on my face. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have all this information on structure, dynamics, you know, interacting partners, location, numbers. So there is so much information that is being discovered by different scientists at different points of time, but there is not an easy way to visualize all of it, you know, put together. And that's when some smart people, including my current mentor, Janet Uwasa, decided to use 3D animation to put to integrate uh, all that information. So a scientist can visualize it all together um, and include any missing parts or just bring those theories, ideas and discoveries to life. Uh, this really helps a scientist see it for themselves and also show it to others because all this while this movie was playing in their heads. So this brings me closer to the paper we will discuss today. And what do you think? Diksha, are you excited? Yes, at least pretending to be. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so I think the cool thing is that when you first brought up that there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of these models, I mean, it's very clear that though all of those models couldn't have come from the same people. So I'm sure they all look different and it must be a massive feat to try and put these all into one digestible language, you know, and make sure that there are no repetitions or like trying to figure out how all of the pieces fit together. So I think is, is that kind of what your, your mentor is working on? Is that kind of like the space that you work in? Um, yeah, it's kind of related to, um, there are different versions of the structures, but it's like, sometimes, you know, you have a long structure and people would have actually just discovered like bits of it. So okay. We do, I think we, yeah, so you're right. We do kind of put all, all those pieces together to, to see how it might look. Um, so yeah, that's exciting, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, oh, hold on. Oh, there's a slide missing. But in our lab, we, use, we mostly use 3D animation software as a tool to visualize molecular processes. 
And uh, we use uh, tools that are very similar to what animation studios, that is Pixar and Disney use. So there is a lot of similarity in our work process, uh, which I thought you might find interesting. But uh, I know the you're not much into animated movies, right? So you may not find this yeah. that interesting. <laughs> but then, again. <laughs> but then my goal is now to develop your interest. <laughs> Christina, do you like animated movies? I like anything where I get to sit there and watch something entertaining. So I'm going to go with a yes on this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so here you see Pixar's production pipeline, which is generally put up at the expos or exhibitions. So um, you can see that the movie goes through this process um, and it's not linear. So there's a lot of crosstalk between you know, this, the, the steps and you have specialists for each of those steps. So the paper that I will discuss with you today talks about a similar process that we follow in the lab while creating molecular animations, but we do all of those steps ourselves. So we are more of 3D generalists. Okay, so this is the paper that we will discuss today. And uh, I may be right in assuming that Dee has not read any of my papers or even stared at it, but I, I want you to know that there are a few different types of papers or articles that we write as scientists. And what is special about this paper is that um, it's not like majority of the science papers that talk about a research study or a peer reviewed study. Uh, and by peer review, I mean that a few experts in the field review the paper to decide if it's thorough and if it's good enough to be published or not, and if it needs more work to be done before publication. So this one was not peer reviewed, and it was an invited article where the journal editor invited us to write a snapshot about the technology we use in the lab. So um, since I'm guessing that Dee has not seen uh, a paper before, I just wanted to get a little bit into the anatomy of the paper. So you have the journal uh, name here, you have the type of the article, you have the title, and then here you have the authors and the affiliation. And here you have the main content. Uh, and in this case, we're giving a snapshot of uh, the technology we use. And here at the bottom, you have the correspondence if you wanna get in touch with us. All right. Okay. I think you're pretty fun to talk to. So like, I might reach out. <laughs> <laughs> My job is done here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna discuss now is this uh, workflow that I have here. All right, so I just wanted to check if they needed any tape. Um, <laughs> stay awake, <laughs> looks like her eyes are open. <laughs> yes, I'm trying. <laughs> There's, okay. there's so much twin twin statues going on. I'm a big fan. <laughs> okay, so far, hopefully, I have been able to convince you how 3D animation is able to integrate diverse information into a more realistic and intuitive visualization. So now let's get into the workflow. And the first step is uh, defining the hypothesis. This is the stage when scientists approach us with an idea or a concept they want to visualize, or it could be something they want to communicate. It looks pretty much like this photo from Pixar, uh, and it's too bad that I don't have a pic of me discussing you know, something with a scientist. So at Pixar, you have a core team of directors that pitch three ideas, and in our case, the scientists pitch their research ideas to us, and we decide if we can help them to visualize or not, and if the visualization is, re you know, is required or not. Once we decide to visualize, there is a long discussion where they explain their thoughts and hypotheses to us and how they envision things to be. So um, on the right side there, you see like a snapshot of uh, just four pages from my Google Notes. So this was for, for one project. And here we put down all our notes, all the information and all the references we, we receive from them. We also put down all the research that goes on into the topic uh, as we read more about it, uh, which you will also see is useful in the next step. So this takes me to the next step, which is storyboarding. Here we draw out individual frames from the animation in 2D to envision how this might look. 
So you can see that this is a fun step. And here I have an example from Pixar again, and extra points for you if you know which animation, animation short this is from. So, um, I can't remember the name of it, but I've definitely seen it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I don't think I remember the title as well. I've seen the animation many times, but now I'm blanking on the... <laughs> don't all the little baby birds go flying at the end? Yes. The big bird flies away? <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> okay, so... Um, this uh, here are some you know this is this is a, a storyboard that I've made which is very similar to uh, what Pixar makes so there's a lot of research that goes into the stage and there are many many drafts at the end of it so here you can see this is the uh, sixth draft I think and this is a two a two page snapshot of uh, um, a storyboard which is much larger than that. Um, so here you will see an illustration of the shot. There will be a description of the shot. Mm -hmm. um, maybe transitions as to how things are going to flow from one shot to the other. There's also narration in some cases. And then there are questions as well, but looks like my questions have disappeared in, at this stage because the questions have been answered mm -hmm. by the scientist. And then there'll be some notes as well here and there. So it looks like where we have like a, a hand drawing representation for like the Pixar stuff, it seems like most of your storyboard ideas are already in the digital realm. Do you do anything before that or do you just like jump right into the computer? So no, I think we can do whatever we want, whatever mm -hmm. is like easier for us. Um, there are times when I actually draw it first on a, on a sheet of paper because that's like faster. Yeah. And then and then, you know, I put it in the digital form. But I do have a colleague, Grace, who generally um, uh, goes into the digital form. I guess it just depends on the comfort level and what your process um, is. Yeah. 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 All right. So I'm going to move on to the next step. And this step is modeling. So here we prepare the models required for the animation. And this is a fun step again, and this is again an example from Pixar and extra points if you know what this an which animation this is from. <laughs> I don't know. All right, we'll 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 see if anybody answers that in the chat later. <laughs> and um, here again are samples from my work. Uh, so. Um, here we have structures of biomolecules, which you have already seen earlier. So here I have another structure, but this is not keratin, it's something else. And here I, I have used it in um, a model that I was creating. Um, and then here on top, you see a bunch of proteins. So this blue sack over here actually has around uh, 50 proteins around it and all these this protein information, that is the structural information that you see here, is uh, got from that website that I mentioned to you earlier about, if you okay. remember. It's called Protein Data Bank. I think I forgot to say what that was. <laughs> All right. So detailed, they're so cool. Yeah. And then we move on. Shada, to the before you get there, which application do you use for modeling? What Good question. Have? So the 3D animation software that we use is uh, Maya. It's by Autodesk. Okay. But you so could also, there are other softwares as well. Okay, so does Pixar use a similar uh, application as well? How so, yeah. So I've read that Disney uses Maya. Uh, Pixar has their own, um, their own software that they've developed, but Autodesk, uh, the, the parent company of this was the same company that developed, helped Pixar develop their, their own software. It's called Presto, um, their software. Um, all right. So now um, we've moved on to the fourth step, which is animating. Once we're done with all the models, this is, this is what we do. And along with the modeling part, actually, this is the time for real experiments. And to give you an example here, so here is an example from Disney, and this is uh, uh, Baymax uh, who's hugging Hero, and so there's a movement where the arms are kind of you know encircling. So in in my case, I wanted to show you. I have a similar movement where I have this white immune cell that is trying to kind of you know hug this uh, tumor cell. 
And, but then what I actually want to get at is that this is the phase where really experimenting with the dynamics of the biomolecules and how it should move. This again is based on what the scientist thinks, but in some cases we find such information in research, research papers as well. So here is an example that I'll show you where I have this bunch of proteins that are kind of coming together to form this bulge. And then the bulge gets uh, pinched off, I guess. Not yet, okay. <laughs> Thanks for the sound effects. That's the only thing these are missing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I wanna give you, oops. Okay, so here I have uh, another cool example that I just wanted to mention. This was done by my colleague, uh, Grace and my mentor, Janet Iwasa. And uh, so in some cases, scientists uh, have this job of simulating how proteins and biomolecules might be moving and doing things like, you know, forming a cage around that, that yellow shape that you see here. Mm -hmm. um, because we can't really capture all that information on motion uh, with a microscope. Um, even even now, so we we can get the idea. So so we get the so we get that uh, simulation data, and then we um, try to incorporate it in into this uh, animation. So this animation is really cool, and um, I'm, I don't have it here right now. But uh, you need to just make some extra clicks and go on to the website of uh, scienceofhiv.org, and then browse around a bit, and then you'll find it somewhere. <laughs> if you don't, you can email and ask me. No, this is so cool. So you're really, you are through this technology and animating these models, able to visualize things that we as humans do not currently have the ability to video or like actually interact with in reality, which is so cool. <laughs> yes. And you that's why I have an understanding of what this looks like without your work. Yeah, and that's what we hope, you know, to benefit the scientists because they have all these numbers and then when you actually put it together in this form, they can actually see what, what the data shows or what they did. So cool. So after we're done with the animation, we then export out each of those individual frames as images, taking us to our final step, which is compositing. And this is where we put everything together in its final form. We add labels, some special effects, narration. And here again, I have an example from Pixar where they probably created a, this glow here towards the end. And here I have my glow and some special things going on there. So after this, it's showtime folks. I'm going to show you a portion of an animation that I created with uh, a neuroscientist, uh, Shigeki Watanabe at the Johns Hopkins University. He wanted to uh, explain this uh, process that happens in our neurons that, um, that enables them to send out these chemical messengers quickly whenever the neurons are fired up. And I have to tell you, you, you may not know what these molecules are, especially the, I don't expect you to know who the characters are in this movie and uh, what the hell is happening in, there, in that animation. I really don't expect you to know that, but I want you to appreciate um, how many, many, many molecules are kind of doing their thing um, and put together this, you know, amazing molecular process that actually happens in the neurons in milliseconds. So uh, let me, I'm not gonna play the whole thing. Let me just get to the part. Oops. All right, so here we have this electric impulse that's going through the, the neuron. And when it reaches the end of the neuron, you have these yellow color uh, neurotransmitters that are released. And here at this point, uh, I've zoomed into the neuron. So this is, uh, actually the edge of the neuron, this blue line here. And um, let's see what's happening like at the molecular level. So here I'm zooming on this blue sac, which actually holds those, those chemical messengers. And there are these proteins that I'm slowly highlighting. So these proteins are actually involved in this process. I'm introducing them. And then you'll be able to see what they actually do to release uh, those yellow chemicals that are in that blue sac. Are these vesicles? Yeah, yes. Synaptic vesicles. <laughs> You're a neuroscientist now. <laughs> you will appreciate this. This is way better than anything I've ever drawn on a board in front of a class. 
<laughs> well, I hope. <laughs> incredible, incredible. We've been missing you for far too long. <laughs> So now you saw that those sacs kind of fused with the edge of the neuron. So uh, when it's it it kind of fused, it it deposited this extra material. So there's extra blue there now, and that extra blue that's been deposited kind of moves, you know, along to form a bulge um, at at one end of the the neuron. And this bulge kind of grows bigger and bigger with the help of these, these multiple proteins. So these mm -hmm. proteins kind of come together and they, they make this bulge. And then the bulge grows. Let's wait for a few seconds. The bulge is still growing. <laughs> it's going back in. <laughs> and then now the, the neck of the bulge is kind of narrowing. Yep. And then eventually, pinch, pinch, pinch. Yes, it's Woo! pinched. Made it again. And now <laughs> the, blue, the blue sack escapes. And now um, it's going to fuse with another sac, bigger sac. And then now the proteins are doing something there where there's another bulge that gets formed. And we have another vesicle sac that gets pinched off. And those proteins are kind of released. And now we're zooming into the sac. What's happening in the sac? Now the sac are kind of getting filled with uh, some other chemicals. Uh -huh. And including that chemical that you saw earlier, the yellow chemical, which is the neurotransmitter. And now it kind of goes back to the original spot where it uh, released those chemicals. So this animation kind of shows how the, the recycling is happening. So it starts from here and then it comes back to the same spot. So, so that, that's, that's the end of the movie. <laughs> that's incredible. I know that like for me, when I, whenever I teach people about kind of how neurons work and how changes occur at the synapse and how neurotransmitters are sent from one neuron to another in the synaptic space, that it's really hard for people to visualize that stuff when you can't just look at it. So I, I can't imagine having any better way to do that than to look at an animation like this. I've never seen anything this detailed or anything like this. It's really incredible. That's awesome. All right. And in case you, wait, hold on. In case you forgot, this was the paper that we were discussing. We just went over the workflow and uh, I will probably not be discussing the advantages and the disadvantages. Um, as any wise person knows, any technology comes with its, you know, its own challenges. So right. with that, please go get another drink and <laughs> leave, leave me some questions um, as I check with Dee if she has any questions for me. Dee, are you still awake? Yeah, I, I think when I'm watching a movie like this, I would definitely require subtitles or uh, someone like David Attenborough, you know, giving a commentary in the background. It's, it's very difficult for me to actually understand what's happening. Are you mm -hmm. saying you did not appreciate my commentary that I gave to no, you? No, no, I, I, I did. But then I was just uh, telling you that, you know, in order to make it into a movie yeah. for a wider audience, that would be nice. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I uh, completely agree with you. And this animation actually does have a narration, but it's mostly geared for like the scientist audience because they understand the terms and the proteins. But you're right. Um, for a regular um uh, like a general audience animation, um, subtitles is also a good idea. Yes. And also having it in multiple languages is also a nice idea. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes. But wait, I kind of forgot to thank my lab. Yeah. Just wanted to uh, give a shout out to my lab. This is uh, Janet and Grace and, and Margot. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun learning these cool, cool techniques and doing these cool things. And I hope you agree. <laughs> Absolutely. This was like, I, like I said, I've never seen anything like that. Super awesome. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. I'm sure you'll have plenty of people reaching out from watching this episode to try and learn more or find more of your visualizations. I know personally, I went to your website earlier today and I was blown away going through all of your animations and illustrations. So I highly recommend that anybody who's watching this, who thought that video was cool, take a step and go over to Shadha's website to see more for sure. Um, with that, I think we'll move on to the next part of our program. So thank you so much, 
Shraddha for sharing that presentation. And thank you, Deeksha, for hanging in there, even though it is three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So let me think. What should we do next? Just kidding. Of course, I know I'm the host. We're going to briefly veer away from our standard programming to welcome Zed Sahir, a research scientist at San Diego State University and a future featured specialist on peers and pubs. So Zed, let's welcome you to the video screen now. Hey, everyone. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So we have you as a little bit of a surprise guest and a preview of what's come, what's to come on our next episode of Peers and Pub. So I was wondering if you could give us a quick sneak peek of your research and you study signs in American Sign Language and how do you use those in order to make, a, make some really informative discoveries that are going to inform our understanding of how, uh, how general language works. Well, thank you for the warm introduction. And first of all, I want to say congratulations to oh, Dr. Christina. Thank <laughs> you. I really appreciate it. Hat. <laughs> I love all these hats. I can't figure out how to put one on. I would be celebrating too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great achievement. And um, so congratulations. I hope you have a strong drink to celebrate. Oh, yes, absolutely. Quite a few over the course of the weekend. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, uh, I'm okay to share my screen now. Absolutely. Uh, oops, okay, here we go. Um, mm -hmm. All right, yes, yeah, so I am actually, um, so thank you so much for having me on this show. I, I I'm really appreciate it. Um, and um, I absolutely love the opportunity to give you a sneak um, preview of some of the work that um, I do with my colleagues um, here at San Diego State University in California. Um, so um, I just have a few minutes, so hopefully I will just whet your appetite and you will go and check out our website. Um, what do I do? As Christina mentioned, I am interested in language. So I'm a nerdy linguist and I nerd out a lot about the brain. Um, and I study, I use the study of sign languages to really to find out what is um, universal to all human languages. And today, I just want to give you a little preview of some of this, um, this amazing tool that um, we've created um, with, um, in collaboration with um, many people, actually. Uh, a lot of work went into this um, visualization. And it's nowhere near as fancy as Shraddha's visualizations. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I am so blown away by all that. And I definitely uh, am going to go and stalk her on the on her website too um, maybe you can join forces for a project <laughs> actually i think that would be a fantastic idea i i definitely have some ideas now so yes that would be cool um okay so um imagine so in an english language um um the words like joke and ruin don't rhyme okay but in american sign language they actually do. So in um, the English, so um, just like in English, we can choose words that sound like um, one another, that rhyme. Um, a, a sign language poet can choose signs that echo one another visually. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but how do we find signs that look like each other, that echo one another visually. Um, so if you're looking for words that rhyme in the English language, you can go to a dictionary or a database. And, but for American Sign Language, no such thing has been really available until recently. So um, when... Um, when we communicate uh, in um, any language, we must search for the right words in our mental vocabulary, right? So we all have a vocabulary um, of, it's like a, like a database or like a diction, mental dictionary of words that we recognize and that we use. And um, American Sign Language signers also have um, 
uh, kind of mental vocabulary. And sometimes we refer to this mental vocabulary as mental lexicon and how quickly and efficiently you search for the right words through your mental lexicon really depends on how it's organized. So um, our team wanted to create um, this, um, wanted to create a database uh, of ASL signs and then use this database to figure out how signs are organized in the human mind. Cool. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, um, so we collected a lot of data, we created um, this database and we wanted to sort of create a visual representation of this, right? Because we all visual, we love visual stuff. Um, Shraddha made a really great point that that is actually how a lot of people learn. Um, so we wanted to create this sort of mental map of ASL signs. So if you went on, uh, okay, yes, so the video was now playing. So if you went to this interactive visualization on our database and looked at the sign for joke, you will find out that it visually rhymes with the sign for ruin, right? So it looks very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and you would also find that it's connected with other signs in the lexicon too, that um, kind of echo. Um, this sign too, that you use a similar hand shape or movements, for example. Yeah. So you could say that these signs visually rhyme. Um, so nuts. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's so crazy to me because of course I think about how words rhyme in spoken language because that's my predominant way of communicating, but I have never thought of how it could be different and how the relationships between words could be different in American Sign Language. This is blowing my mind. Yes, it's actually, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So now that we have this tool, we can actually um, use this tool to um, even just um, find signs that uh, occur frequently in American Sign Language. So um, signs that are used very commonly. Um, and the whole idea about then when you are um, looking up signs in your mental lexicon, the idea is that these signs that look like one another or the signs that are really, really frequent, really common, kind of pop up into your mind first. So they kind of allow you to sign um, faster than if you were to trying to remember the sign for uh, a less common sign like um, dinosaur. Gotcha. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I, I definitely encourage everyone to go to um, uh, our website, which is freely accessible. It's free for everyone. Uh, you can play around with it um, just very quickly, just the very superficial information. What you find there is if you click on the node, so you will see all the different nodes. Um, larger nodes represent more common signs in ASL. And then smaller nodes represent for um, rare, represent rare signs in ASL. And when you see the lines that connect other signs, that just shows you how many signs that particular sign is related to visually. Um, so as you can see, some signs actually are within a, a, a very big network of signs. We call them neighborhoods or clusters. Um, in other words, they have many friends. Um, but other signs kind of um, live in a smaller neighborhoods. They have fewer friends or fewer neighbors, um, fewer um, visually similar signs. Um, and then if you look in the left-hand panel, you can find tons of more information about ASL signs, like how common they are in everyday signing, whether they're nouns or verbs, or you know what kind of hand shapes do these signs contain? So yeah, go and play and hopefully, um, you'll have fun doing it. And um, thank you very much for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing with us. This is so cool for any of you guys who are in the audience and also on at the beginning. I also want to point out in terms of data visualization that we're dealing with a similar system here that we saw with that eye tracking data 
earlier. So two totally different data sets, but where larger circles indicate like things that are more common or more robust. And then we have lines that are connecting these different nodes. So these circles are often called nodes and lines that are connecting them to, to indicate that there's a relationship between them. So, oh my gosh, that I have never thought of data like this. I have never thought of relationships between um, between uh, American Sign Language signs like this. I'm really excited to look into this, into this uh, software and I look forward to chatting more with you on our next episode of Peers and Pubs. Excellent. And I just wanted to say big thanks to the team that actually helped us realize these uh, visualizations. Of course. And they're based at Boston University. And so without... Um, Without these amazing software engineers, this tool would not be possible. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty great. And we're very, very fortunate to be able to conduct this type of research and Absolutely. share it with you. Of course, all of the major, the biggest improvements that we have, have a team of really awesome people behind them. So it's always important to make sure that we acknowledge them. All right, so in the meantime, before our next episode of Peers and Pubs, if you wanna keep up with Zed, I wanna encourage you to follow her work on that website that we just saw at the top of the screen, which is asl-lex.org. All right, and we'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> okay, so friends, we're gonna give you the chance to step up and demonstrate your data visualization knowledge. Now that we've talked a lot about how we can demonstrate data in different ways and what that might look like. But before that, I'd like to remind you that Taste of Science is a nonprofit and we do rely on science lovers just like you to keep our programs running. So if you would consider going to tasteofscience.org and hitting donate, we would absolutely love it. Um, but until next month. I just hope you do. It would be nice. <laughs> okay. So if you're familiar with our program at this point, you're probably thinking that it's time to move into trivia, but in fact, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. Um, so we're inviting you, the audience, to step up and try your, uh, try your ability at determining whether or not we have some good or bad data visualization examples in front of us. So what's in it for you? Well, we have some super shiny limited edition Peers and Pubs pins, and I don't have one to show you now, but I promise they are great because I have one myself. And we don't just give these to anyone, so I do want to let you know that we have a team of experts sitting behind the scenes ready to determine which one of you brings the bravest, best, and funniest explanations of what you think is going on wrong or right in the next graph that we're about to show. And if you really want to, we might even be able to get you up on camera to show your face in order for you to give us a little bit of a, a snippet of what you think of the next visualizations. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen again. And here we go. Okay, so we're looking at good data viz versus bad data viz. This is where we want your participation as an audience to help us figure out what, what's going on in these data visualizations. So how about this one? Let's see what you guys have to say. Please put your responses in the chat. Please barge in on our, uh, our Q&A on Zoom or our chat on Facebook and let, you, let us know what you think might be wrong with what's going on here. I'll give you a couple minutes to respond. I'm not gonna give it away. Take a look at maybe the parts of the whole. Maybe take a look at how different parts of it look like maybe different sizes and not because it's not because it's just a pie chart, but maybe there's maybe there's something else going on there. All right, now we're gonna move on to the next one. Hopefully I've got some responses from you guys. All right, now how about this one? We're obviously looking at something that's a little bit lower tech here, but let me know if you think that this is a good data viz example or a not so good data viz example and why. I personally like the colors in this one and I'm a big fan of just using a pen and a paper to communicate my ideas. So 
Whereas earlier, Shraddha was talking about the fact that some people can go straight to a computer. That has never been me. All right, so let me know what you think about this one in the chat. And now we're gonna move on to the last one. So this one immediately is a little bit more aggressive than the others, but there's one particular thing that stands out that is different from any of the other graphs that we've looked at today. And I'm wondering if you can figure out what that is, aside from this co the, the color scheme. All right, I'm seeing your responses rolling in now. Thank you so much for all of your contributions. <laughs> all right, let me see if I can highlight some of the highlights here. All right, especially from the last one, somebody got this one pretty quickly. Yeah, the axis, that y axis is upside down. We're starting at a zero up at the top, which means it's just really confusing to interpret it interpret the data. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna leave the judging up to our panelists that are hanging out on behind the scenes and we're gonna move on from this part of today's activity. So I wish you the best of luck in getting your peers and pubs pins. At this particular moment, I would like to welcome Shraddha back to the screen because she's gonna share an infographic of how to interpret data that I think will be really uh, a really great way to end this discussion of good versus bad data visualization. Um, Shraddha, so come on back. What have you got for us? Hello, you can hear me now, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. And hopefully you can see it. Okay, so um, we've got this amazing amount of information today, and you know we've really dissected uh, how to read graphs and uh, how to look at visuals. And um, I feel it would be it, it's a it's a nice point for us to actually summarize all that we learned, and uh, probably this would also remind you of uh, the, the 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 stuff that you just answered right now. Um, so um, there's some things that I want you to remember with respect to uh, the anatomy of a good graph. That is when you see a graph in the media or you know, in the news, what are the things that you need to really look at and um, to know that this is good information? So uh, one thing is uh, to look at the title. So um, if it's a really you know, sensational title, like something like, you know, um, which compares um, um, pregnant monkeys with uh, consumption of chocolate or something, uh, you should immediately, you know, kind of raise the alarm in your minds. Uh, if it's a really sensational title, uh, you should already start being skeptical about this graph. And um, next, you should really look at the axes and the, the, the labels and the units that are there for the axes, something that Christina really um, hit upon earlier. Uh, these should be really clear. And if this is not there, don't even just just ignore the graph. Don't even like look at it further. And then um, you should also look at the origin and uh, see if the increments in the axis are uniform. So this is again what Christina mentioned earlier. Um, see where it begins. If you know if it begin, begins at zero or if it begins at some other number, because uh, a lot of times um, uh, graphs, you know, the bad graphs kind of focus only on the portion that they want you to see, but they're not really looking at the bigger picture. So that is really important to keep in mind. The other thing is data clarity. Uh, the, the real content and the data and the graph, is that really clear or is that really obscure? Uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind is um, um, preferably it should not be in 3D if it's not talking about 3D information. Um, if it has like this landscape or like a major distracting picture in the background, it might be really difficult to um, see the data and the, the creator might actually may, I don't know, may be trying to hide something. So uh, make sure that the data looks really clear and is explained very well as to what you are saying. And then finally, really uh, see where the source of this information is from. 
um, really try to see if it's you know a good source, if they've done good research, if you can trust this data. And until and unless you, you check off all these points, really um, don't share this information because that's how uh, misinformation spreads. That's it. Absolutely, and that's a great summary of everything that we've chatted about and a phenomenal way to recap how to actually go over data. I think I'm breaking up here. <laughs> um, all right, so we do have some questions for you. Can you hear me still? Yeah, I can. Okay. It's all right. just so that you get uh, pixelated. All right, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go grab a charger while we're while we're on here real quick and see if I think the one that I'm currently plugged into stopped working. But I'm gonna start by handing you over the first question. So that is, how do you envision that your 3D work will influence public understanding of drug development or public health in general? Do you think you can speak to that from your presentation earlier? Yeah, sure. And at this point, I, I probably would also want, um, you know, the Diksha, you can come online if, if you if you want. We can kind of do this, tackle this together now that you have enough information on what I do. Uh, so if you're still there, D, you can come back online. Uh, but to answer your question, um, I, I think, uh, yes, absolutely, it can be instrumental. It really depends on uh, what the goal is to, you know, um, of course, when we make visuals, we're really thinking about the audience and what their needs are and what the purpose is of showing that visualization. So if it's if it's to convince like a like a drug maker about you know the or a drug maker is trying to convince uh, a physician or um, uh, maybe a patient about how the the drug works and if it's done very well, of course you know it's uh, it's going to be meaningful and probably you know the patient might take the drug or uh, the physician might use the drug. So that is one aspect. What was the other audience that Christina that you mentioned? Yeah. So the other the other audience was just like public health in general. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think um, again. I think I'm going to give you a similar answer based on uh, who the audience is. We can always devise uh, specific visuals, and it, it, I feel it really sometimes is able to com communicate things that you can't really. Um, communicate by just reading like blocks of text. So um, I guess it's gonna be useful as well. Definitely. Actually, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier too, that that narration that we have that goes along with any of your visualizations can be tailored to a particular audience. So it's a super easy way to think about how this could be beneficial to not only the science community, but also the general public. So that's awesome. Right, and also using analogies because you know if you're talking to a particular type of audience, if there's something that they're really familiar with, then you can use that analogy in the video to kind of you know talk about the real concept that you are you're trying to address. So that's yeah. also one thing you can use. Absolutely. All right, we have another question for you. So this one says. How do you verify abstract animations against benchtop science? Um, is there an abstraction here that is a priori and untestable? How do you work around that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. And that's something that we ourselves constantly think about because, um, you know, in these animations, there are parts where, which is directly derived from data. And then there are parts where we had to um, put in fillers or, you know, create something based on what it might look like or what it might be. So that distinction, we're still not able to really create. Like we can't really tell in, in this animation that you saw today, how much is actually based on data and how much is not. So that is still something that we are trying to figure out how to efficiently do that. Uh, so that's, that's a very good question. Awesome. Okay, another one from one of our participants on Zoom says, how did you decide on the color schemes for the proteins? You mentioned fluorescent. Do proteins have color or wh what is that about? Yeah, no, that's that's a wonderful question again. So I remember I did mention this earlier that um, these are representations of you know the biomolecule, the, the proteins, but this may, this is not exactly how it looks. It's not pink inside or it's not yellow inside. So um, we um, color them um, many times based on what the convention is. Like for example, in the animation that you saw, uh, 
so the, in neuroscience especially, so there are these proteins called the snare proteins, and there are three of them, and they're always represented in uh, red, blue, and green. So we try to first see if there's a convention in the field, and then we try to stick to that. Many times we just follow what the, the scientist wants. So they have been following a scheme while uh, communicating information in their, you know, in their papers, so we kind of follow that scheme, but sometimes we try to make it a little intuitive. Like if it's a lipid, we make it yellow because, you know, you, you connect oil, lipids to oil and oil is generally, you know, yellowish. So we kind of try to do that as well. That's awesome. All right. So we have another question. How long does it take to make one of these animations? Yeah, so actually, this is one of the challenges that I didn't talk about earlier. Um, it, it takes a couple of months. So it depends. So this um, animation that I showed you today, it, it was made over a period of one year. So, you know, the, the initial research kind of takes a long time, but then um, also figuring out how to model what proteins and you know uh, this this whole process maybe if i was if i if i was only working on that animation it could have been done in uh, maybe 3 3 4 months but it takes it takes a while yeah that's a long time but i mean science takes time everything that's in the lab takes time so i would imagine that visualizing it takes time too <laughs> yeah and yeah no i'm glad you brought that up because you know sometimes what happens so we've started with this animation and actually for this animation in the middle the scientists kind of changed their mind and they were like hey can we actually include this hey we're getting new data can we just include this as well in the animation so that happens as well and that's why um, it gets delayed the beauty of collaboration. <laughs> Everybody right. and, and research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, we have another question um, from a participant on Zoom, and they want to know how do you determine what words are? Oh, oh, actually, this is a question for Zed. Do we still have Zed in the in the room? Do we do we think can we have Zed come back? I'm back. Hey, hey, Zed, welcome back. I have a question for you. How do you determine what words are rare or common in ASL to determine a node size? Great question. That is that is a great question. Um, for sign languages, it's a little bit more difficult because sign languages don't have a written form. So we can't really just go to um, you know, the internet to search through huge amounts of text to see how many times a word appears, right? So we have to go about it um, in a slightly different way. Um, so we gathered a large group of deaf ASL signers who use um, American Sign Language in their day-to-day -day conversation. And we asked them um, to rate these signs on a scale from one to seven. How often do these signs appear in their day-to-day -day signing? Um, one being never or almost never, and then seven being like really frequently, really commonly. And then we basically calculated the average of these ratings. And that gives us an idea of how common these signs are. And that actually corresponds pretty closely to um, what actually happens in reality. Like we've kind of compared that data with some data that is based on spoken language research. And we are very confident that that truly reflects how common these signs are in ASL. So cool. All right, thank you. I'm glad you are still around. I didn't have any idea. <laughs> I love this. I love thank this you so much. All right, let me see what else we have for questions here. Uh, all right, we may we may have made it to the end of our question list. So let's take one quick moment to step back through some of those good versus data uh, good good versus bad data visualization examples. And I want to give you some of the answers uh, to, to what we ran into a, a little bit earlier. So on that very first graph, um, when we were looking at that pie chart, first of all, as just as Shraddha just highlighted, one of the worst ways to demonstrate data or visualize data that's not 3D is by putting it in a 3D structure because it adds an element, a 3D element to the data that, that really is important and, and it's not not critical to your understanding of what's going on. So it makes some of the pie chart slices look a little bit bigger than some of the other ones, just because it's made into a 3D object, uh, just, just for fun. 
Um, and so I don't know if you all noticed, but another thing that was wrong with that first graph that we showed you was if you were to add all of those percentages up from that Fox News graph, you're looking at over a hundred percent. So that we highlighted at the beginning. And if you caught it, then you're doing your job trying to be a critical, uh, critical data reader, a critical graph reader. So congratulations to you if you figured that one out. All right. So on to the second graph. That one is pretty. It's beautiful, really well laid out. It's definitely dated and it's definitely not digitized, um, but it provides way more information than the previous visualization. And it's a really interesting analysis. So that one, we kind of tried to trick you a little bit there and it's actually not an example of bad data viz. It's an, an example of good data viz. All right, and then just a couple of quick notes about our third graph that we showed you. We definitely, I saw in the chat earlier that someone noticed right away that the Y axis went from zero on the top to the highest numbers down at the bottom. So it was upside down, which made it really hard to understand. Um, additionally, we actually didn't see any data that had error bars today. And error bars are really important for you to be able to see not only where the mean or average bit of the data is, but how much the, the outliers in that group kind of gener uh, were separate from the mean. Um, so no error bars, especially on that last graph, and the red up top was really distracting and took away from the point of the graph. So congratulations to all of you that, that provided us like critical feedback of what you were viewing on the screen in the chat. And I want to mention also our winners who will be getting pins from Peers and Pose. So we've got Deirdre and Clara and Krizika. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. All three of you are our winners. So please reach out to us on social media or in the chat now to make sure that we have a way to contact you and send you your prize. So thank you so much for participating in that little event. We really appreciate it. All right. So our very, very, very last thing before we go, Shana, I wanted to ask you if you had any kind of share, any kind of story that you wanted to share about scientific publishing or the scientific publishing process. Yeah, I actually, um, I think it's a good thing that it's been very um, uneventful. So I, nothing crazy has happened, which is great, I, I guess. Uh, but I, I do remember um, there was this one time, um, uh, this was an opinion article that I wrote um, here itself when I was in this lab. And um, um, the so I wrote the article and then we submitted to the editor and the editor came back with uh, a couple changes in 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 the sentences which made the the meaning of the sent you know of what I was I was trying to say like change so that was um, a little disappointing for me and um, but then uh, we kind of stuck our ground and said hey you know we just want to stick to whatever however it was you know written. So that was something that I came across, which um, I thought about, but um, it's it's been smooth so far and I not had any untoward experiences. <laughs> well, that's great. I know a lot of people do not share that sentiment and some people always have some sort of story that will stick with them for the rest of their lives. So that's good. I'm glad to hear it's been smooth sailing for you. I have a similar, similar experience. Um, so that's wonderful. All right. So I just want to take this opportunity one more time to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your animations with us. Um, is there anything else that you would like to tell our audience before we depart? Um, I guess I'll go back to the goals and I really uh, hope you guys will be able to uh, explain what I do in your own words in maybe two lines to a friend that you see next time. So that would be really nice. Um, and um, keep visualizing no matter, uh, you know, which field you are in, keep visualizing, be skeptical, skeptical about the, the visuals that you see, especially in the media. Um, I guess, yeah, those, those are just the two, two things that I want to do point out. But thank you so much for, for coming today and listening to me and for all those wonderful questions. Oh my gosh, of course. That's phenomenal advice. Be skeptical. I think that applies to every aspect of our lives. You always want to make sure you're critical of what's coming in and you have a good grasp of what you're taking in and making sure you get it uh, exactly as it's intended. Thank you so much for joining us. We do have um, one more slide that we're going to share today. So we're doing one more, <laughs> one more thing. So Parveer, 
Um, what, what have we got here? We've got one more graph to share with you to think about kind of how data visualization can go awry. Oh my. <laughs> All right. So we want you to leave thinking about the perils of data interpretation. And so as we leave this up on the screen, we want you to, I just want to reiterate that I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you again to our guests and um, our, our, our presentations that were part of our program this evening. So I want to make sure that you keep up with Shraddha and Zed. And I also want to take one more moment to say thank you to Deeksha again for joining us at three o'clock in the morning. And also, of course, keep in touch with us on our social media channels and on our website at peersandpubs.org. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you again, Shraddha. Nice to meet you and hang out with you. Thanks, Christina. Bye-bye. Bye now. And I think Deeksha slept. I have a feeling she slept. Oh, she probably did. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> All right, bye, oh, everyone. I would call you soon. I'm still here. Oh, she's still here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. All right. Everyone. Have a great night. Go back to bed. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Bye. Peace. Bye.